for those that aren't aware of concurrent training, I guess a bit of an overview or an intro to why it's important for not just AFL athletes, but field-based athletes. So firstly, I think it's important to define concurrent training because I think it can be a misconstrued sometimes. So, I mean, in essence, the simultaneous completion of both endurance and resistance training modalities as part of the dress training program. So if you're doing the same, the two modalities at the same time with the same program, you're concurrently trained. And nowadays, if you're a big on Instagram, you can see that that's hybrid or you can call it whatever you want to call it. But in essence, that is what the literature refers to as concurrent training. So given for AFL that the diverse physical demands needed to be successful, pretty common for most team sport athletes and in particular to complete uh, concurrent training and, and in particular same day concurrent training. So doing those two divergent bouts on the same day. What would be your advice to still look after their strengths and ensure that they are moving the needle for areas that they want to get better at? When we're looking at your endurance training and in, uh, resistance training uh, combined versus resistance training alone, combining the two results in attenuation of gains in muscle mass and strength and power and things like that. So it's understanding that there is an interference effect. So it's then it's how we prescribe around that. And so, because it's easy to say, we'll just train on the alternate day because the literature says alternate day training results in greater adaptations and improvements in, say, lower body strength and mass. But it's like when you're a, whether a recreational or an elite level team sport athlete, it's like, that's not possible. And that was sort of the basis of our research and, and what we look to uncover. And so, yeah, in essence, like how do we optimize our training program? And so some of the Results of the research from my PhD, which was embedded with Gold Coast, was that there was an inverse relationship between running exertion and amount lifted. So that's where when you were doing, this is acutely. So if you were doing a lot of, say, sprint distance over 75 and 85% of max velocity and also a lot of global high speed running, so above 15 kilometers per hour, this had the greatest negative effect on the subsequent same day resistance training performance. And so that was the percentage of arm lifted and the tonnage. And so it's like, we know if you're doing like a high intensity day, that's going to inhibit that same day resistance training stimulus. And then your more recent experiences in combat sports, what are some of the different challenges, I guess, compared to AFL athletes that you face from a programming perspective? When you look at AFL and team sport athletes, they're locomotive based. And so obviously running is part of the skills and, and obviously it's prioritized as a supplementary conditioning modality where combat sports in particular, it's multiplanular where the basis sport orientation changes. So it can be prone or supine or seated or standing. With AFL, you can constrain, say, like a, a Monday session. It might be a, a linear skills day and, and you can still work on, say, top end speed and but not have them change the direction with a, a high degree of intensity or, or velocity. And so you can sort of modulate and constrain that part of the training while still getting some genuine technical and technical development. With combat, it's a little bit harder. So there are sessions that are teaching based or drilling based in nature, but it's like, there's normally still a live drilling component to that session. Uh, and so pretty much like all the sessions are hard. So it's much more difficult to modulate their weekly load. If you compare the, the session up here load, like an AFL in season might be 2,500 to 3,500 arbitrary units where for combat, it might be 3,500 to 5,400. So modulating that load and managing fatigue is a lot more difficult. What are some important things to take into account to maximize potentiation? for athletes yeah. that want to get more explosive. So that was a really interesting thing that we looked at two of my latter studies in my PhD. There was a, a heap of research around post-activation potentiation and, and using contrast training in just gym-based settings, but there wasn't a lot that had looked at it in the presence of same-day concurrent training. The literature sort of said that you, you needed eight to 12 minutes between your initial conditioning contraction and then your plyometric tasks to see a potentiation effect, which if you're prescribing in a, an elite sport environment when you've got an hour, like you're not going to do a set of box squats, wait for eight minutes to do a set of drop jumps. Like it's just not realistic or feasible. That's when we looked at if we change the conditioning contraction stimulus, can we see potentiation effects? So we kept the three arrow box squat. We used that. We did a, a three second quarter squat MVC on a Smith machine. And then we looked at a, a band conditioning contraction. So looking at about 30% of body weight with athletes trying to hit 1.0 minutes per second and a band based velocity squat with VBT feedback. And so comparing those three conditioning contractions on drop jump performance using a one minute recovery period, we found that the band based velocity squat actually improved the subsequent plyometric performance. What I mean, some other things that you sort of noticed about uh, working with someone like that, but it's such great experience that you've picked up and, and brought into your coaching. The application of a systematic model, and which is fortunate, something that I'd always been passionate about myself, having a, an overarching systematic model in mind in terms of like, for me, it's always like, what's the worst case scenario? So what are the match demands? How do we break that down into sort of the skills based, the field based and the gym based? And then if you take them another level, it's like, what are the determinants of elite performance? So what is the global plan? What do you need generally to be successful in the sport? And then what does the individual need? And just being here, like that's the way they do that and the and the FMA model they have where it's the, the final, the martial artist and, and the athlete and the way that they almost like approach that triad and that 
the holistic approach to development of the athlete is, is just 